Hey guys, it's Alana and Jamie from the Praying Christian Women podcast. Welcome to another COVID conversation. Hey there, how's it going today? Things here are going pretty well. I think that we're, we're just kind of in a rhythm. Um, it in a way looks like kind of like what life looks like before, but in a way it feels totally different and we're just, we're doing okay though. Like it's, it's um, I think we're all in, in my family handling things better than I would have guessed if you had like told us what was coming. That's good. Mm-hmm. And I think that's mm-hmm. one of the blessings of kind of, you know, being the frog in the frying pan instead of being all of a sudden consumed with fire. Like you just kind of, you adapt little by little. And I guess that's kind of a, a morbid example. because No, not- I get what you're saying though. You know, we finished watching the Lord of the Rings trilogy as a family. Mm-hmm. And there were so many times where, no, we're not in a war, which we've already talked about how different this would feel. But in a way it's similar because like, you know, if the U.S. goes the way of Italy, it's going to turn really bad Mm -hmm. in like a week or two. Um, And I I really hope that that's not what's coming. And I pray that's not what's coming. But I think it still sort of feels like the calm before the storm. Mm -hmm. And there's not much that you can do, but wait. And so like there were so many scenes that I really resonated with in Lord of the Rings, where there's just these everyday people, you know, waiting for these armies to come and attack, you know, and it's not like they're trained soldiers, most of them, they're just, a week ago, they were farming their land and hanging out with their friends, and, you know, so, I don't know. Even the introductory monologue where Galadriel is like, the world is changing, you know, like, that, that totally you know, resonates with what's, you know, wow, this is a world like we've never seen before. It's Yeah, it really is. And then on the other hand, though, I'm getting, I think like with each day, I'm just getting more and more hopeful that things are going to turn out okay. I'm not saying that it's not going to get bad and it, it probably is, you know, in our neck of the woods going to get worse. But I also see that like, you know, the human race has gotten through so many other things And God is so powerful. So I'm, I guess I'm kind of, I've got a foot in both sides of the fence for like, yes, I know things are bad. I know this is really serious, but I also just know that God's on the throne and I don't know. So I guess I'm feeling just kind of a surreal peace. Um, I guess if you were being pessimistic, you might call it resignation, but it actually, it doesn't feel that way. It feels really hopeful. Yeah, and I think I think we come to a point where in a good way we resign this false idea mm-hmm. that we have any control. And I think exactly. that's a good thing and and resignation mm-hmm. coupled with peace as opposed to resignation coupled with despair and True. hopelessness. Mm-hmm. You know, right. that kind of resignation like is I think it's what and and maybe I'm wrong. There might be tons of people out there that don't have faith, but I feel like as people, I think that sets us apart as people with faith from people that don't have faith is that we can resign any self-control, not any self-control, any control of what's going on and yet have hope that someone is in control and that it's not just horrible chaos spinning out of control Mm -hmm. and that there is a hope. I don't know. That's one thing that does. I know there are probably people that don't have faith that are able to be, you know, well, it is what it is, but it'll be all right, you know, probably. But I would say if you did statistics that having that kind of faith is just something that, um, that can allow us to, to more freely hold up a sense of yeah. not being in control. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, it certainly doesn't hurt. Yeah. And, you know, again, I'm just waking up each day so thankful. Mm-hmm. I'm not sick. <laughs> That's always the first thing I do when I wake up. I check in with myself. Does my throat yeah. hurt? Do I have a cough? Nope. Great. <laughs> yep. I know that feeling because, like I said, we've all had these little, like, dry hacking coughs for weeks Mm -hmm. now because of the construction. Mm -hmm. I feel like they're starting to wane, but like I woke up this morning with a headache, which isn't, you know, I used to never have headaches, but I think Mm -hmm. the age that I'm at a certain age where I think Mm -hmm. hormonally things are changing. So the last couple of years I have definitely become more like I'll wake up and sometimes I'll have a headache that I can't explain. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
And so this morning was one of those days and I thought, oh, am I getting sick? And, right. you know, and I'm coughing a little bit thinking, oh no, but I'm not. My headache's going mm-hmm. away right now. A little bit of yeah. coffee. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And I also just feel like God made humans to be so resilient. Yeah. And I think that there's just something in our psychology that's going to, in most cases, that's, you know, like if... I look back at the pressure that I felt during the first couple of days. Yes. I just don't think that most healthy human minds can live in that state for very long. And I think God just designed our brains to take that stress and find a way to compartmentalize things and mm-hmm. deal with things. And, and that's a gift. You know, that is such a gift from the Lord. He didn't have to program us to be that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling really good these past couple of days. I'm really thankful for that. I'm glad. I am also just sensing hope, just real hope mm-hmm. and just yes. a, almost like, a, um, like as I see these, you know, stories of people coming together and um, like, it's just, uh, I, I guess it might be similar to like 9-11 when we were, it, we were not frying pan in the fire kind of thing, you know, where we weren't like the, the, we didn't see it coming. Man. That mm-hmm. was, that was boom, a, like, boom, mm-hmm. horrible. And, you know, for me personally, there was like shock and I probably went through all of the stages. I don't know what they are, but you know, I'm, were you on the East coast at that time? Yeah. We were, were in Virginia. Virginia. Okay. Yeah. So fairly close. Yeah. Oh, so, and my family is in DC. So mm, that was okay. when, when the Pentagon got hit and I tried calling Scary. my dad. Mm-hmm. The, phone, the call wouldn't go through. And so that yeah. was terrifying. So um, anyway, but the, you know, there was shock, then there was anger, you know, something's got to be done and how could they do this and mm-hmm. what, what are we going to do? But after that, just this emotional, like just this outpouring within our country and the world supporting us, you know, mm-hmm. and um, during that time, it was, it was really heartwarming and i'm i'm sensing in a different to a different degree but it, and in a different way that same kind of world coming together now there's mm-hmm. some ugly stuff too which is disappointing but you know there's some really i'm i'm finding that i'm clinging to that those hope those those stories of hope and encouragement yeah definitely do you have any specific stories that stand out in your mind right now um well one story uh, well, just some of the things that I shared yesterday about the teachers, you know, right, the teachers right. Together. That's neat. Um, there's one story of um, the NBA players that were, which I shared. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. Were coming together and putting money toward mm-hmm. helping people. And I know there've been a couple of others um, and I'm just, I'm drawing a blank right now, but Yeah. I follow the Broadway musical page on Facebook. Yeah. And it's been really fun. Like some of the most famous composers have been having little like playoff wars, like um, Andrew Lloyd Webber. Is that his name or is that the, is that the Phantom of the Opera guy? Or did I get the name yeah. wrong? No, no. Yeah. I'm, okay. yeah, I get I'm him, thinking Frank Lloyd I get, Wright. <laughs> I get him and the architect mixed yeah. up. Yeah. Frank Lloyd Wright is the architect. Thank Andrew you. Lloyd Webber is the, no, I know. I had to think for a second. I was like, I think so, that's right. Yeah. Like he and the composer of the Hamilton musical, like they're doing this little piano wars with each other and Patrick Stewart's reading Shakespeare sonnets. And I, I just, it's fun to see I'm not, you know, I don't follow celebrity gossip, but it is fun to see these people that, you know, you just know from pop culture who are in the exact same boat. They're at home with their little like webcams, (laughs) you know what I mean? Just doing their thing. Right. And I think that is, I think that's some of the stuff and like, you know, our GCI, Alaska's internet provider Mm -hmm is giving free internet to people that don't have internet because of Mm -hmm. students that need it for school. And, um, what are some of the other things, you know, just people, people being very generous and kind. It's true. Um, Yeah. We're seeing that in for sure in the author community, there's a lot of like discounted library book opportunities or, um, 
do you know about Scribd? Did I tell you about Scribd where you can, it's like unlimited audiobooks and ebooks? Oh, yeah. C R I B D. And they're offering 30 days free to everybody. I'm pretty sure it's one of those like no credit card required sign up. So it's like unlimited reading, listening. It's just so neat to see, um, you know, people doing what they can in their sphere to make a difference. And I think it's a really neat reminder too, just how important the arts are. You know, like if you think about all the things I mentioned, it's Shakespeare sonnets and musicals and free eBooks and someone kind of got on a high horse <clears throat> because, you know, celebrities were taking this opportunity to like, let me sing you guys an inspiring song, you know, mm -hmm. while we're all in isolation. And there's been a little bit of backlash in that like, you guys are people who have money. So why aren't you doing something to make a real difference? And I think I, I take the difference with that argument because I, I really do feel like the arts are so important for getting people through times like this. Oh, absolutely. And who's to say, we don't know what they're doing with their money. I, I, that's, I feel like yeah, that's, that's for sure true. You know, yeah. I mean, who knows what they're donating to or who they're helping or mm -hmm. not helping. That's, that's kind of a, yeah, yeah. That. And who knows what that song is going to do or that book or that story is going to do. Like I, I listened to somebody, I forget who it was, but I know I know somebody <laughs> who was actually, they were saved to Christ at a Michael Jackson concert. Oh because, my goodness. Yeah. He, he sat down and was doing like an acoustic version. Do you remember You Are Not Alone? Oh yeah. I love that song. And God like touched that individual oh and they goodness. were saved as a result of like some, you know, the king of pop singing a song and um there's another story i love where um this guy like it starts it's a terrible story it's a true crime story about um a teenage daughter who masterminded the murder of her whole family and her father ended up surviving and in the process he lost like two sons and his wife and obviously lost his teenage daughter because now she's in jail and having to live with this, you know, realization that she's the one who did this, but they also burned the house down afterwards. And so he went back to the site just to see if there was anything left that he could recover. And he found a page from a Christian fiction novel. And it was about like, I, I don't remember the exact passage but it said something to the effect of you know and he looked at god and he said you took everything from me you took my family and you took my house how could you do this and then like god brought him comfort something like that like through it was like wow. one half of the page that had been salvaged from the ashes mm. so i don't know i i absolutely believe that the arts is so important for this time and i'm actually i'm a little concerned um my husband and I have made comments a ton, like there really, this is my opinion, but there really wasn't a ton of good art that came out in the 2000s. And I think a lot of that has to do, we were reeling from 9-11 and then we had the housing crash and then like the 20 teens were amazing in terms of um, like great movies, great TV shows, great independent kind of film things. And so I'm a little worried that you know, if this persists and we, we're stuck in another really major pandemic, I'm, I'm kind of worried that the arts are going to take another decade to recover. I sure hope not, because I think that is so important. It is. And, you know, I feel like in some ways, um, trials and difficult times can be like, you know, the, the fire that forges good art in the long mm -hmm. term, but mm -hmm. things like movies and things that in the require short term, yeah. in the short term, I, I'm wondering how they can practically continue. I That's, know. You we're know, pretty so. bummed that we're not going to be able to see the, the Black Widow Marvel movie in May. We were all looking forward to that. Now, what they're doing right now, Amazon is actually making, I think it's Amazon, is making movies that would have been in the theaters or mm -hmm. at least the ones that had been in the theaters. Some are going to be released right to digital. Yeah. Or like yeah. the amount that, you know, it would cost probably like 20 bucks or something. Right. So I wonder if they'll do that and have virtual releases. I don't know. We'll have to see. I know. It's it's strange. It, it really is. But again, we're safe. We're healthy. We truly couldn't ask for anything else. So yeah. I have a friend, um, the first person... I know of who at least suspected that he had 
coronavirus. He's a writing friend of mine in the UK and emailed me a couple days ago and he's like, hey, guess what? I'm stuck in bed with coronavirus. And it was very, um, it was bizarre, but thankfully I heard from him again yesterday and it's possible that it might just be influenza, <laughs> which is so funny that that's like now a relief. But, so um, has, ha, was he able to be tested? That or, I do not know. I think yeah. he was um, presumed positive and now it's, so I'm not sure. I yeah. don't know all the details, but um, it was, it was good to hear, you know, that it's probably, probably not coronavirus. Yeah. No, I was wondering, I was thinking when, when uh, that will be a turning point personally is when mm -hmm. I know someone, someone you know personally, whether yeah. it's someone in our community or somewhere far away that well, has it. Cause right now I don't yeah. know of anyone personally. I do right. know of one person who has a close contact that's being tested. Mm -hmm. And so this person is waiting to hear <clears throat> from that, but right, not because they might've been exposed. Yeah. Right. But, but if you might be exposed, they're not making a mandatory quarantine or anything like mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. So my husband and I have kind of this ongoing, like not conflict, but yeah. my husband's perspective is, you know, why are people complaining about the lack of tests? If you think you have it, self-quarantine, it's very simple. But for me, I feel like the testing is really important because, so for instance, there was a doctor in Anchorage. I just read a story today about a doctor in Anchorage that started having symptoms, um, really bad uh, headache and had a bad fever, coughing, sore throat, hard to breathe. Um, and for some reason, she was not able to be tested. She, I, I don't know, in the article, it didn't specifically do the timeline. She said that she tried to get, she called the hotline, tried to get tested and they wouldn't test her because she didn't have symptoms. So I don't know if she tried to get tested before the symptoms or after she stopped having symptoms. But or she maybe say, it was like, oh, you have to have a certain number, you know, right. here's all the symptoms you have to right. have five out of seven. Right. Or seven. Which it sounds like she had a lot, but so yeah. here we have a healthcare worker. Mm -hmm. She said that she self-quarantined as well as quarantining a patient and a coworker that had mm -hmm. close contact with her. But I'm thinking, okay, so that's just three people quarantined. Here's this physician that is seeing many people every day. Right, right. If she is not tested, and so she's waiting to hear the test results now, but if she was not tested, then they can't go back and look at all of her contacts. They're not going to notify all of her patients other than the ones that might read that article and be like, oh my goodness, I was treated by her. Right. So if without the testing, you're not able to let people know, just like this person that I know that had mm -hmm. close contact with someone that mm -hmm. started showing symptoms, other than by word of mouth hearing, well, I might have it. She, right. she isn't able to know that she needs, you know, these people aren't, aren't knowing that they need to be quarantined and then it's too late. So then you've got right. tons of other people. So I don't know. That's just my, no, you know, my I husband agree. And I, uh, yeah. having, but I, I also agree with my husband, just be smart. If, if you hear stuff like this, quarantine yourself. If you feel like you're sick, quarantine yourself to the extent that you can, you know, to, and I know everyone doesn't have that luxury, but. Yeah, no, I think part. that testing is, is important, but unfortunately it's just, it's not as available as I know the healthcare workers are hoping for it to be. If nothing else, I think it's also like, wouldn't it be amazing if every single person could get a test Mm -hmm. Because, you know, one of the reasons why this is spreading so quickly is because you're asymptomatic while you're contagious. Right. And so wouldn't it be great? Let's test everybody right now. Symptoms or not. I know it's not going to work because of the testing shortage, which I don't really blame anybody. I, you know, who could have foreseen this? But right. if we could, let's just make up our hypothetical best case scenario, test everybody, whether they have symptoms or not. And if you get tested positive, you, you know, you quarantine and um, I don't know. I mean, isn't that going to save a lot of people? <laughs> well, I think one of the problems with that is, and I was reading an article about this, is if you get tested when you're asymptomatic, you, it, you may not have enough copies of the virus in your oh, system. Okay. 
to mm -hmm. register positive. So then okay. you might need, so, you know, for Trump and, and, and Pence and like a lot mm -hmm. of these people mm -hmm. that are being preemptively tested to make sure, cause they're interacting mm -hmm. with people regularly. Um, they Got could it. have false negatives if it's okay. too early on. But and let's that say, could, yeah. yeah. And that could, and then that could make you a false unwise. Yeah. False right. security. Mm -hmm. Or, That's true. but, but if there, but there are people like, I'm thinking of like Tom Hanks and his wife that hardly had any symptoms and they did test positive. So, I mean, if we had an unlimited supply of tests, then absolutely that would be the yeah, way to just go. Test just everybody. Why yeah. Not? <laughs> well, I know when I worked at the hospital, it was all about universal precautions and you mm -hmm. just, you treat everything as if it is, you know, really bad. You know, that was in the nineties. So it was like, treat every patient and every thing you encounter as if it might have HIV, you know, or right. mad cow disease. Do you remember that? That was another oh, one yes. that was going on. You know, you just, you treat everything as if it's more <laughs> mad infectious. Cow. <laughs> mad cow and disease. I forgot about that. Wouldn't it be fun to go back to the days where the only health concern was mad cow disease? No, um, no offense meant to anybody who might've suffered through, cause I know it's bad. No, it's <laughs> but, um, bad. I mean, yeah. it's not good, but yeah, I don't know. So, you know, it was interesting though when, um, so my, my author friend who for at least a few days thought that he actually had coronavirus um, and is still recovering, kind of what you were saying, like you're just kind of waiting for that first direct person, you know? Yeah. In a way, this sounds very, very bad and it, it makes me feel selfish to admit, but there was a sense of relief when I heard because it was like, okay, this, this is real this is happening and my life hasn't ended. Like, does that make sense? Do you know what I mean? Like, okay, I know somebody who is presumed positive. I'm worried for them. I'm praying for their health. And now like, it's almost as if um, one of the hard parts about being right where we are is this expectation that things are likely to get worse in the next week or two. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully they're not going to get really, really, really bad, but it is presumably going to get at least somewhat worse than it is now. And there's part of me that just kind of wants to know how bad it's going to get. Right. Of course you, know? you do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a similar experience. So there's a podcast that I like, it's called That Sounds Fun with Annie F. Downs. Uh -huh. And it's, a, and, and so she actually, um, was one, I mean, it was kind of early on. I'm trying to think of when it was early March when she was notified by the health department that her close friend, she had a close friend that I guess she had heard from the friend first was mm -hmm. positive for coronavirus. And she was told that she had to be quarant like mandatory quarantine mm -hmm. couldn't leave her house for two weeks. Every day, someone called in twice a day and she had to take her temperature on the phone with that health department mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. um, and so she knew, I think at the time, the county that she lived in had like 10 coronavirus, case, coronavirus cases, and she knew three of them. Wow. And so she's sitting there, and to my knowledge, and she, so she posted these like, uh, I can't remember what she called them, like the quarantine episodes or something. Uh, the, that sounds fun, quarantine episodes, where she did kind of what we're doing. She got together with mm -hmm. a friend, and they just yeah. talked a little bit for like 20 or 30 minutes each day. Mm -hmm. And to my knowledge, she never got it. I, I, I actually skipped ahead mm -hmm. to hear like, okay, I know, I want to know, it? are you going to get sick? <laughs> I don't think she got sick. And so my thought was, wow, here's this person. She was with someone that three people at an event mm -hmm. where this was, mm -hmm. you know, and she didn't get it. So in a way for me, that was like, well, cause I'm, I don't, I mean, we don't know how this virus acts. We're assuming that it's extremely contagious. And I was reading an article about the struck, the, you know, the microscopic, like, you know, mm -hmm. physical makeup of the virus and how yeah. it actually has these hooks that are really, and there's another like, cle so there's a hooks that cause it to hold on to cells well. And there's like mm. a cleavage site that makes it really efficient at getting into your cells. And uh -huh. so it is definitely very effective at infecting people once you're yeah, exposed yeah. to it. But, um, but I, you know, I'm like, oh, well, here's this anecdotal thing. She knows a bunch of people that have it and mm -hmm. she's okay. Or even, yeah. and, and this thought has gone through my mind, but of course you don't want to go there because you don't know how it's going to affect you. There are young people dying, but I think, well, wouldn't it be what I really would love to happen is for my whole family to get it, be fine 
and move on. And then just be over. I've had that thought a little bit too. I, I definitely don't truly wish that on us. No, because you don't know how it's going to end. You know? Exactly. And so well, you and don't want to go through that, that or have your kids go through that. <clears throat> Even having contracted and then recovered from swine flu, like my body never fully recovered from that. Really? You know, See, so, my husband and I, and I think our oldest son, who was uh-huh. the only child we had at the time, had swine flu. I was yeah, the only one and you that were was okay. Yeah, it really wasn't that bad okay. for me. I was, I worked at a childcare, I worked at a preschool mm-hmm. at the time. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to think of the chronology of events, but I know my son was sick with Mm -hmm. a cold kind of thing, like respiratory illness. Mm -hmm. It wasn't super bad, but shortly after he was recovering, I got it. And it was Mm -hmm. a really bad cough, like, like, but I was going to work and, and, you know, I was just washing my hands a lot and sanitizing. Mm -hmm. But when I, I can't remember what, maybe I had a fever. And so I had to stay okay. home for a day. Mm-hmm. And when I called in, cause I had the cough first and then I had a fever. I don't know, okay. but my boss said, you have to go in by law, like not by law, but because of our, because of the swine flu, yeah, you need yeah. to go in and get tested. Mm-hmm. So I had this gross test done where they like put a thing up my, down my nose and into my throat. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, uh, I want to say I had to wait 24 hours. It wasn't a long time, maybe one okay. or two days. Mm-hmm. And then I was confer- and I had to stay home until I got the result. Right, and right. I had the swine flu. And yeah. so th- I presumed that my son had had it, my husband right. and I, while I had this cough and while, and he had the cough too, went to a U2 concert. And at this time, it wasn't like this where people were saying, right, quarantine, sure. stay home. Yeah. yeah, it never got to that stage. No. And so we mm-hmm. didn't know. And Actually, the kind of funny thing was the person that we rode to the concert with was a friend of his from work who invited a friend. That friend brought a lot. We picked her up at her work, and she was a health worker for her company, and she brought a cooler full of swine flu vaccines in the trunk. Or no, oh, wow. It, it rode, I want to say it even was in the car with us. My husband and I were in the back seat, and I think the cooler was like riding with us. It was just kind of a funny thing because looking weird. back, we're like, we didn't even, we didn't even dream that we had the swine flu. Right. Right. Anyway, it was just very interesting, but yeah, at least I had the swine flu, if not our whole family. And Mm -hmm. I would definitely not say it was the worst thing. It I was functional, highly functional during the entire thing. So it was a mild case in our case. My husband got it a little worse. Our son, it was like, nothing for him. Okay. Well, I was pregnant at the time, which probably made it harder. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, pregnant, yeah. Pregnancy makes you more susceptible to any respiratory Mm -hmm. or anything really probably. Yeah. 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 Um, on a totally different note, I realize you haven't seen our puppy in a while and she's taking a nap behind me. Can you see her? I can't. You need to put it down. Oh my goodness. She has gotten big. big. Look at her. So for those of you that are listening to our podcast on like our syndicated podcast, you can also go to our YouTube channel and you right. can watch the video. You can see. see the doggy. She's beautiful. I almost shut up in my bathrobe. I'm going to do it one day. As long as we're continuing doing like daily or near daily one day, I'm just going to show up in my bathrobe because. All right. So yeah. I don't have a bathrobe and I feel oh, like this is, thing. I need a bathrobe. I have slippers that are getting less comfortable the more uh-huh. I wear them. I've been wearing them a lot <laughs> lately. Yeah. But, um, so maybe I need to get a bathrobe as, as part of my self-care. That is some pretty good self-care. And then we can coordinate our bathrobe wearing. We can. We'll do a bathrobe day. Okay. Okay. So something I wanted to talk about, I know we don't want to take too long, you know, we don't want to go for hours, but I do want to revisit the Louisiana church. Yeah. Did you do more research? I did. And it wasn't even on purpose. I just happened to, was reading the news and I saw a little video. Okay. It's appalling. So is it? I okay. revise my statement. There's no more like walking on eggshells. That dude is in the wrong. The there okay. were people sweating and jumping around and like mm. shoulder to shoulder, laying mm. hands on yeah. people, and it was very mm. disturbing. Um, okay, one thousand people is what it said. There were 1000 yeah. people <clears throat> and it, they were shoulder to shoulder in this tent. I don't care if you're outside or not. It was, yeah. it was absolutely 
just, Aww. yeah. So I'm very sad. And they interviewed this woman who looked like she was probably in the at-risk age range. Right. And she said, I'm not going to let coronavirus keep me away from my church. And, and I felt bad because, you know, what I want to start doing, because y'all know I have been, I, some, some critical nature has been well yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. through this. And I've really seen it. Even this morning, I made a comment to my husband about something and, and I've been joking. I'm like, why, when did I become a hater? Like I used to be kind of Pollyanna, but I, I think, really, I've become a little bit bitter in I think areas. the older you get, you get a little bit more realistic about things. Are you I calling think me old? No, no, I'm just, I'm just I know, I know, but do you know what I'm right. saying? I think Absolutely. that I could see if I were, if I were 20, I would be like, all right, you guys are overreacting. Or at least right. I could see why you would think that. Like I did stupid stuff in college. Like I Me would too. take the subway home from Boston to my campus and walk like three quarters of a mile in the dark back to my dorm at midnight. Like, oh, me too. Dumb. And I wasn't in Boston, but I was I was in Southwest Virginia, which is, yeah. is way more you just, rural. You don't think about but, stuff like that. Oh, I would walk in the dark and look at the stars and yeah. go down to the drill mm -hmm. field all alone. So anyway, but yes, I there at less was at stake too. Because at that point, I yeah. think becoming a parent also makes you oh, more for aware. Sure. Being the child of an aging parent, you know, I mean, I, oh, think, uh -huh. I think I think all of those things. So yeah. to reframe, what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to, when I hear stories like this that just make me like, make make something rise up in me, right. I think, okay, let me put myself in the position of this person and let me try to think like they're thinking and see them like God sees them. Okay. Like, cause he sees into their hearts. He sees their motives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and un unfortunately there are some situations where I'm just like, that person is just horrible, but <laughs> no, <laughs> but, I get it. But like mm -hmm. that lady, okay. I was able to put myself in her position and think, you know what, that lady, she, she loves the Lord. She might, that might be the only time in her week that she gets to be around people that love God that she gets to feel spiritually uplifted. The nature of the service is, is like that there is an energy there. People are, you know, just really coming together. And that energy would be lost in some way if you did it virtually. I can totally get that. But that does not negate the fact that you have to be careful. And then I look at the mm -hmm. pastor and I think this man is probably, I, I don't know what his motives are, but what I can know is that as Christians, I know that especially as leaders, we can become ultra sensitive to anything infringing on our right to worship. And so mm -hmm. there have been cases where worship has been, you know, people have, you know, whether, I don't know, just in, in, in many different ways where. Yeah. Our, like our there rights, was a, a home that couldn't have a Bible study meet there because the neighbors were complaining about parking spots or, you know, think, I get it. Right, things know. like that where, you know, maybe he really has this desire, this God-given desire mm -hmm. to want to protect his right to worship God. And so, yes, but then that right gets skewed. And so, you know, I just, I, I, I think there's a big, I think one really important thing we can glean from this story is there is a difference between protecting our right to worship God and what's happening now, because what's happening mm -hmm. now isn't people trying to squash our attempts at, at sharing the gospel. That's not True. what's at stake here. And that's not what's going mm -hmm. on here. So I think we need mm -hmm. to really separate that out. So, but yeah, I was really um, disturbed by seeing all of yeah. those people and, and yeah, just so, yeah. Well, yeah. I appreciate like that exercise that you had of, you know, it sounds like you're kind of extending the benefit of the doubt as opposed to just being really critical and trying to see where they're coming from. Yeah. But I you think can it's still come away from that exercise. Believe and be like, yeah, you action, shouldn't have done that. <laughs> the action is wrong. Yeah. But you can what maybe, makes, yeah. Yeah. What makes me sad is like, it would be one thing if you were like, yeah, I'm going to go risk myself, like my, my grandma that we've talked about a ton on the show, mm -hmm. she did a missionary trip to China when some people told her she shouldn't because of bird flu. Mm -hmm. And in her mind, it was, God's going to take care of me. And even if he doesn't, I'm okay with that. And I can respect that for sure. But I think what makes this different is that what's at risk isn't just your health. You know, it's kind of everybody around you 
and things like that. That's what, to me, makes it a little different. If it was just, hey, I'm willing to risk my health and safety because I, gosh darn it, want to go worship the Lord, I'm more okay with that. Um, but when it's, you know, when it's like this, where it's being made so clear that the importance of social distancing isn't to make your family stay healthy, it's to really just we're, we're kind of all doing our part. I think that's what makes those kinds of gatherings upsetting to me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's to me, it's kind of like saying, well, I have the right to smoke and, and, you know, well, well, why can't I smoke in this baby's room? You know, exactly. Because, you know, that kind of thing. Like, well, it truly is. You do yes. have the right to, you do smoke, have the right to smoke, but, but that baby should not be put at risk. That's a really good way of yeah. putting it. Yeah. Yeah. I had something else that I wanted to say regarding this and I totally spaced out. So well, I this is interesting. My, yeah, Scott just spoken. texted me. He's picking up some prescriptions. He just said that the pharmacy has actual um, six foot like tape lines on the floor. Like you stand here, oh, <laughs> you stand yeah. over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're, um, we're probably going to move everything over because the Walgreens here has like a drive through pharmacy. So mm -hmm. I, I'd feel more comfortable about that. You know, Scott's still going out to his office where mm -hmm. most of the time he's the only person who's there. Um, so theoretically it should be fine, but he's also the one doing like the grocery runs and I get a little nervous, especially, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's becoming clear that this isn't just people with underlying health conditions that are getting right affected, you know, and, and having a hard time. Well, I remember what I was going to say. It has to do with calculated <laughs> risks. So okay. our, one of our longtime listeners, Marcine, sent. Hi, Marcine. Yeah, she's awesome. She's so she encouraging. Really is. And she sends all these great articles. She actually sent me, I shared on the Praying Christian Women website, this really funny, I mean, like it made me laugh out loud, YouTube thing. Did you see it of the woman that's praying? To, no, I saw you post it, a, but I didn't watch. It's kind of a... a a prayer parody, which, you know, uh -huh. I guess some people could think it's sacrilegious. I think we need to laugh and we need to be able we to We need just, our humor. Yeah. So it was Even funny. if it's Check dark it humor. <laughs> it is, but it was just, you know, like, like basically like the prayer of a mom stuck at home with her kid. It, it's funny. You got to go. It's funny. It's okay. Funny. But Marcine sent this link because we had started our COVID conversation mm -hmm. and it was I, I need to, I'll link to it in the, in the description, in the show okay. description. It's a Christian doctor who is addressing how, you know, addressing the, this coronavirus issue and how as Christians we should respond to it. And he does a really good job of talking about as believers, yes, we have a hope in God. As people with brains, we know that this is highly contagious and we mm -hmm. have to adhere mm -hmm. to certain guidelines. Yeah. But he also talks about this calculated risk because he does he talks about Jesus and how Jesus interacted with lepers he touched right. the leper on purpose to heal him he hmm. said as Christians you know there and I was afraid of where he was going with it I thought you know okay. is he Burn going with this from disease or something okay. yeah but he wasn't he was very hmm. pragmatic about it and he said there might be a time during this this pandemic that that you as a Christian need to take a calculated risk and mm. because we have nurses and doctors who are forced into these calculated yeah, risks. But one of the practical examples that I saw and heard of, there were two. Okay. So one is blood donation. We are, are I, I've always given blood up until I had kids and <laughs> I end up, sometimes I would be turned away because my count was low. Cause I tend mm -hmm. to be on the like anemic side, depending mm -hmm. on the time of month. And, mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm an O positive, which is not the universal donor, but whatever. Um, okay. So my questions are, okay, I have not made that calculated risk to, g to give blood. Um, and I, but I've been thinking about it as like, okay, they're saying that they are implementing really safe ways for you to, to donate blood to the blood bank. Um, so that's one, you know, thing. If, if God prompted me, somebody has to do it. Mm -hmm. So would I do that? I don't know if I would or not. Could not you pause it for just a second? I need to run and check on something. I'll be right oh. back. Yep. Sure thing. All right. Okay. We're back. Thank you. Oh, that's okay. So, so the other calculated risk is there were people asking for help 
packing boxes of food for senior citizens, like mm-hmm. emergency food boxes for mm-hmm. senior citizens. Um, again, somebody has to do it. And as, you know, a, a mom with kids, as a mm-hmm. person with exposure to people, uh, like I have exposed, like sometimes, uh, like I receive packages for a neighbor. Right, right. Very compromised. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to do those things just in the name of protecting those things. But like if I was a single adult, I think I would probably really consider doing mm-hmm. those things. But I think what he was saying was, you know, well, another calculated risk I talked about last a couple of days ago last week was, you know, my husband before they did the thing that before they actually did the hunker down. Yeah, right. With the sound. Right. Mm-hmm. That they, you know, he took sanitizing wipes and hand sanitizer and everyone was far apart. There were 10 or fewer. So they were adhering to really strict guidelines. It was mm-hmm. not necessary travel. It right. was something that could have been done another way, but he really felt... Hmm. You know, he really felt uh, like that was something that he was supposed to be doing. And our church leadership thought that was something that they needed to do. And so that was a calculated risk. So I That's don't know. interesting. Yeah. I just, I, you know, I thought that was a perspective of, okay, you know, no, we, yeah, we need to use our brain. If there are things that you feel prompted to do, definitely A, weigh the practical risks and see Mm -hmm. are they going against recommendations or Mm -hmm. mandates by authorities because the bible Mm -hmm. says we are to be subject to authorities right are they being done in a way that is as safe and as responsible as possible because no matter what you do Mm -hmm. you are you're not just thinking about yourself and your family right lots and lots of people that are going to be affected by these things but I don't know. I thought he had a really well-balanced view where, so I don't know. That's all. No, I really like that because I've been thinking about it. You know, Scott and I still haven't had the talk. Like what Mm -hmm. happens if he and I both get sick? Mm -hmm. What are we, you know, who's going to look after the kids? Um, And it made me think, okay, uh, you know, three kids from a home where both parents have like tested positive for coronavirus. I mean, would I take in? Yeah. I mean, I'd take your kids in. And so here's me, you know, offering in public. <laughs> if that happens to your family, yes, yeah, we will here. watch your kids. But that's a lot to ask. You know what I mean? Right. Like you and I, neither of our families have relatives. Um, or, you know, what happens if your backup daycare provider or child care provider is your elderly parents? You know, like it's, I, I like thinking about it that way as opposed to i think maybe if i have erred on an extreme it's been like i am feeling secure in my own family's hunkered Mm downedness you know like we're now 14 days from when my son had his tonsils out and so should either he or i have come into contact with anything while we were in the hospital that danger has passed and Mm -hmm. you know the kids and I went out, I think like a week and a half ago to pick up a prescription. And that's the only time we've been outside. And so part of me is, I think, putting my faith in the fact that we are pretty sequestered, you know, but then again, I get nervous about my husband because I'm like, well, you know, like, yes, you, I don't know. I, I like that idea of looking at it as a calculated risk and not as a, okay, you do this one thing and now you're going to like, you know, expose the whole family and Right. And, and to do so with wisdom and discernment, Mm -hmm. but yeah, uh, but it it is, it's such a personal thing, you know? Yeah. Well, and what do you do if, you know, like the mom and the dad are on different pages, you know, the mom wants to keep living life as normal and the dad's terrified. Like, what do you do? Or the other way around, that's gotta be such a hard situation. Yeah, it definitely is. Hmm. Hard times. It is. Yeah, but there's positive stuff too. Um, I know we had talked about maybe doing some of the devotional. Oh, yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna have to run soon. So how do you want to do it? Do you want to like just read a little bit of it? Do you want to save it for the next time? I could just do, if you need to run, what I could do is just kind of go through it and end in prayer. You want to do that? That would be fun. I could yeah. go through day one. So um, tell us again how people can access this because I think it's going to be really 
inspiring and beneficial for people? Yeah, you can go to prayingchristianwomen.com slash be the light, all one word. And okay. I didn't want to make it like COVID-19 because, <laughs> you know, I really, the, the whole point of this devotional is to remember that at, even as dark as the world could possibly get, we are the light. God has just mm -hmm. chosen us as believers to be a city on a hill, to be, yeah. you know, light. And as the times seem to get darker, it's just, there is this backdrop where our light can shine even more brightly. So yeah. Awesome. So yeah. Prayingchristianwomen.com okay. slash be the light and it'll just, you download it right from there. Okay. Well, I'm here for right now, but I might need to step away. So if okay. I'm not here to say goodbye, this is my goodbye. But for now, I'm here and okay. would love to join you in the devotion reading. All right. Well, so this devotion, day one, so it, it goes through all different um, topics. And so day one focuses on our prayers for family and friends. I just felt like as a starting point, the people that are nearest and dearest to us are those that we absolutely want to be praying for. So the scripture for this day is from John 17, 15. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. And it just talks about the devotional part, talks a little bit about how when Jesus was sending his disciples out into the world. He tells them, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. And I think we kind of feel like this virus is like this, this stalker waiting to attack, just like a wolf attacking a sheep. And, you know, the same Jesus that wept when Lazarus had died, even though he's omniscient, you know, he knew the end, but he wept because he loved Lazarus dearly. I think that he probably felt sadness at the thought of sending these disciples out but his prayer, I just really want to look to that prayer recorded in John 17, 15 as kind of a clue to how we can pray for our loved ones. Because, you know, he says, in this world, we're going to have trouble in John 16, 33. But even knowing that, he doesn't say, God, take them out of the world, remove the trouble from them. He knew that they had to be in the world full of trouble to be the light and to share the gospel. And so we absolutely need to pray for protection because that's, you know, we want to come to God as children come to a father. We're not going to hold back or have a fatalistic thing of, oh, well, God's going to just do what he wants to do. You know, we definitely pray for our wants, which are protect our family and friends, heal them if they're sick. But to stop there would be to miss a huge, I think, message from what Jesus prayed that we need to pray for their spirits to be protected as well. And there is there, God's healing physically is not a guarantee, but what is guaranteed is that when you pray for these people, there are miracles that can show up that might look different from a physical miracle that we need to really open our eyes to as well. So, um, yeah, I think that means for people that aren't believing that we would pray for God to bring salvation to them, to their spirits, um, and for those that are um, believers, that this is a time that they would come to know him in a deeper way and that they would just be strengthened in their spirits. So today's prayer, Father, we just praise you for your love. You love those who are dearest to our hearts with a love more fierce and more perfect than anything that we could imagine. We thank you for showing that love to us and the gift that you gave us through Jesus, through the act of his sacrifice. We confess that we often forget that love and the fact that you withhold no good gift from us or from our loved ones. We commit our friends and our family to you today. We lift them up and stand in the gap on their behalf, asking you to protect them from sickness. We pray that their bodies would be strengthened and healthy. In the event of exposure or illness, we pray that their immune systems would be primed and ready to fight and for quick recovery. For those that are far away from us or isolated, we pray for peace and for freedom from anxiety or worry. We thank you so much, Lord, for ways that we can communicate and connect even in isolation. But most of all, God, we just lift up their spirits to you, and we ask not that you would take them out of this fallen world, but protect their spirits from the evil one. For those of our friends and family that know you, we ask that you would renew their hope and their faith in you as the sustainer of life, the giver of good gifts, and their help in times of trouble. We pray for your protection against negative thoughts about you or doubts that you're out for their good. 
fan the flame of the Holy Spirit in them, Lord, that they would be salt and light in a world and a time that desperately needs you. Be glorified in their lives at every step. For those that don't know you, we pray that you would call them from death to eternal life. Use us in any way that you see fit to point them to you. God, give us wisdom to know when to speak, when to remain silent, and how to encourage them in our words and in our actions. Move in them and all around them that there would be no doubts in their minds that you are real and that your son Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. In the powerful name of your son Jesus, amen. Amen. That was wonderful. Thank all you. Right. Well, hey, else? I think that good? covers it. I mean, that was... <laughs> That was some pretty thorough praying. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, God. That was, um, yeah. Yeah. We will, I guess, check in tomorrow. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. Stay yeah. well, everybody listening. Stay well. You guys are in our prayers. Jamie, thanks again for joining me doing this. It's such yeah. a nice kind of reprieve to the day. Yeah. So, and, and I hope that those of you listening are enjoying these conversations as well and and feeling encouraged and feeling connected i think yeah. that's two things that we desperately need right now so yeah this is all fun. right talk to you guys soon all righty bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.